Ephesians chapter 17, verse 24, and Michelle has offered to recite the text, so I'm going to invite her to come on up and ask you all now, ask each of us to listen attentively to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Now this I affirm and insist in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles lived, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupted and deluded by its lusts, and renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with a new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I, I'm feeling a little discombobulated today for some reason. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but uh, some of it may have to do with my disappointment. I'm, I'm a little disappointed because I had this big plan for my sermon, and I discovered that it just, it just wasn't going to come together like I wanted it to. But um, I've been thinking about this for several weeks now, and I had it all laid out. And so I went, and I kind of snuck into the food pantry, and I, I stole one of uh, Michelle's bags of tea. So I got that ready, and then I went to the front yard, and I got my little little stone slab. I was going to use that for part of my, my object lesson, my prop. And I got my little, my little nut can. I cut an air hole in the top of it, so that was good. And then I went online and looked on Amazon, and I got my bag of 24 rubber frogs. So have that in place. And then I borrowed from Susan. She's out of town today, but I borrowed from Susan her, her camp stove. And it was all coming together. I thought everything was going to work out splendidly. And then I realized I had a problem, and it wasn't going to work after all. Which, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's for the best, because I could see after I did this, I could see some of you saying, you know, Pastor Ryan, forget about the, uh, you know, forget about the gimmicks and just preach the Word of God. So maybe, that's, maybe what I just need to do is just focus on, on preaching the Word of God. I, I'm called to be a minister of Word and Sacrament. God's Word has power. I should just rely on the Word. I'm not trying to draw attention to myself or do anything clever. Just preach the Word. But on the other hand, if you look in Scripture itself, there I can think of a number of examples where God calls someone to proclaim God's truth, and they use an object lesson, or they use some kind of visual cue to reinforce that message. Uh, for example, like the prophet Jeremiah, when um, he was warning the people of, of Jerusalem that they're about to be taken captive by the Babylonians. He made this yoke out of iron, and he laid it across his back. And he said, this is what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. You're going to be under the yoke of slavery, under the power of the people of Babylon. About the same time, maybe a few years later, um, God spoke to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was told by God to take this big brick and, and carve into the brick like a relief map of the, of the city of Jerusalem and put a steel plate here and do this over there. And, and by doing that, you're going, to show the city, you're going to show the people what the city of Jerusalem looks like and how they're going to be under siege from the people of Babylon. And then when they don't listen to him, the next thing that Ezekiel does is he starts to cook his food under a fire, and he uses human dung as the, uh, the fuel for the fire. And like, why would he do that? Well, because it's disgusting, and it's unclean. And all the people would say, why are you doing that? That's disgusting and unclean. And he would say, well, this, now you have your attention. This is what I want to tell you about. And then um, as we've gone through the book of, of the Ephesians, um, I shared with you before how the prophet Agabus comes up to the apostle Paul. He takes Paul's own belt, right? And he binds his, his wrists together. He binds his feet together. And Agabus says to Paul, using this, this, this visual aid to drive home the truth that he's sharing, he says, this is what's going to happen to the man who owns this belt. And he tells Paul when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested for sharing the gospel. And that's exactly what happens to him. So, well, in any case, my plans didn't work out. I can't share my little object lesson like I wanted to. So I'm just going to preach the word. So here we go. Um, verse 17, Paul says, Now this I affirm and I insist on in the Lord, you must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their mind. 
And so Paul is making a, a, a demarcation between Jews and Gentiles. Well, actually between God's covenant people and Gentiles. You know, he was a Jew. The Gentiles were everyone else who were not Jews. But now um, both Jews and Gentiles have come to faith in Christ. And he's drawing a distinction between them, the believers, and the Gentiles, the people who do not yet believe in the God who's been revealed to Israel, who's been revealed in Jesus Christ, the unbelieving people. He says, no longer live as the Gentiles live. Remember, the the church in Ephesus was made up mostly of, of Gentile people, some Jews, mostly Gentiles, who came to faith in Christ. And he says, you live differently now. You're a different people than you once were. Don't go back to that old way of life. It wasn't long ago that most of the church in Ephesus were pagan people that worshipped other gods. And if you go to the book of Acts, you see them cry out when Paul's sharing the gospel in Ephesus, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, they're worshipping this pagan god. And because they worshipped these false gods, they lived in futility. They, they didn't know who the creator of the universe was. They weren't in a relationship with the loving God, the loving god that we know. Um, they, were, they were confused. He says they lived in ignorance. They didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know they could experience the love of God through faith in Christ. They didn't know they could have the peace of being forgiven or the hope of going to heaven or the joy of being counted among God's people. They didn't know any of that. They lived in ignorance. And then Paul says that they also suffered from a hardness of heart. They they didn't care about God. They didn't know about him. They didn't care about him. They They didn't care to love the God of the universe or to love their neighbor as themselves because they hadn't believed in Christ yet. And so the work of the Holy Spirit wasn't activating their hearts at this time. But at this point now, as he's writing to them, they, they do believe in Jesus. They become part of God's covenant people, and their, their whole lives have changed. They're, they're a new creation in Christ. And yet, you know, we are creatures of habit. And it's easy for us to fall back into old patterns of behavior. And that's what Paul's warning them against. Don't fall back in that old way of life. He says, you must no longer live as the Gentiles live. And even as Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, remember, this is the word of God. And he's also then writing to us. It also applies to us as well. And so, you know, we're we're part of God's covenant people. Um, But he's warning us, don't live like those who don't believe in Jesus. Don't don't live like those who are outside of God's covenant. Don't live like those who are are still in the world. Don't fall back in those old patterns of behavior that's so easy for us to fall back into. Now, as Paul says this, he's comparing the believers to unbelievers. And he's he's basically saying, compare yourself to those who don't know Jesus and make sure you're not living like them. And that's a dangerous thing. It's, It's always a dangerous thing for us to start comparing ourselves to other people. Because what happens then? If I, you know, here I am, I'm a believer in Jesus, and I look at that person who's not a believer in Jesus, and it'd be real easy for me to say, well, you know, I'm more generous than they are, I'm more pious than they are, I go to church, you know, I worship God, I read the Bible, I'm kinder than they are, I'm more thoughtful than they are, and that can very easily lead to an attitude of arrogance, um, an, atti- an attitude of pride. We very easily can be like the Pharisees were and in, in often betrayed, portrayed in, in the Gospels, right? The Pharisee prays, I thank God I'm not like this tax collector. That's very dangerous. And so first, and, and oh, and then the other side is that we look at someone who doesn't believe in Jesus and we say, wow, they're, they're kinder than I am. They're more generous than I am. They're, they're more, they have more self-control than I do. And looking at them, then we could, by comparing ourselves, we might feel jealous, we might feel envious, might even lead it to us questioning our own salvation. Maybe I don't believe in Jesus. You know, I should be living differently than I am if that person's better than me. In any case, we compare ourselves to others and get ourselves in trouble in a big hurry. And so first and foremost, we should compare ourselves to the standards that God has given us, right? And I mentioned this in previous sermons in the book of Ephesians, where we're going through Ephesians. You know, Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. And we compare ourselves to God's perfect and holy standards, it's very quickly realize I'm nowhere near where I'm supposed to be. I'm not even close to living up to the calling I'm supposed to live by. And 
And that should, as we recognize that God loves us and accepts us anyway in Christ Jesus, that he's forgiven us through our faith in Christ, that should then lead us to a position of gratitude and of thanksgiving and of humility. So first and foremost, we look to God. And then Paul prompts us to not live as the Gentiles do. We, we'll do that after we have this proper attitude of humility and thanksgiving and gratitude and repentance. Then we see, we should be able to see, though, my life is different than that person who doesn't believe. Remember, the book of Ephesus is open by addressing the church as saints. And saints are people who are called to be holy, called to be set apart, called to be different from the world. And so our lives should be different from unbelievers. We should be able to look at them and say, you know what? I, I live differently than they do. I live by a different standard than they live by. I, I, have, I have a calling to live in a certain way as I seek to follow after Christ as my Lord and Savior. We should be more loving. We should be more patient. We should be more kind. We should have more self-control. We should be filled with more peace and more joy. And Paul tells us in verse 19 why our behavior should be noticeably different than the Gentiles. He says the Gentiles have lost all sensitivity. He says they have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The Gentiles lost sensitivity. They, they're not sensitive to the will of God in their life. They're not sensitive to God's claim upon their lives. They're not sensitive to their need to repent from their sins as they've, as they've turned their backs on God or not responded to God. And so that takes me to my original plan for my, my little object lesson, my, my sermon illustration. Uh, so last week, I went to the pet store, and I went frog shopping. And they only had one kind of frog. I was kind of disappointed. It was a little tiny green frog about this big. And so I was going to get that frog, but I didn't want it to die between now and su- then and Sunday. So I decided not to buy it just yet. Instead, I went online. I was looking for frogs, plastic frogs, that I could buy that looked like the frog in the frog store. And I couldn't find one frog that looked like the frog in the frog store. I had to buy a set of 24 frogs to sift through them and find the best match. And then I got my little, my little uh, nut jar with an air hole in the top. And I was going to buy my little frog. And I was going to bring it down here and show you all my living frog and my thing. And you could see it. And you could name it. You have become affectionately attached to our frog. And then I was, gonna, uh, I was inspired by Taylor and his sleight of hand, his magic, his illusions. And what I was going to do is I was going to have my, my pot up here. Of course, it's going to be a flame, nice warm water. And I was going to pretend like I put the living frog in the pot, but only slipped in the plastic frog in the pot, right? And then I got, I got my tea bag to kind of discolor the water and make a little bit of pond water and also kind of hide it so you couldn't see that the frog was a fake frog. And then I got the stone there because I was thinking, you know, if this frog melts, I don't want it to ruin the bottom of the pot. So we'll put it on a stone. Everything was in place. This is going to be great. You guys are going to be shocked. Pastor Ryan is boiling the frog on, in, in worship. And then my fatal flaw came to the plan when I realized that our pot at home, I was thinking it was made out of glass. The lid is made out of glass. The pot itself is made out of stainless steel. You wouldn't have been able to see the frog. So I went shopping for pots. I went to Target. I went to Walmart. I thought for sure there must be a glass pot somewhere in Goldsboro. Everything I saw that made out of glass said on the bottom of it, do not boil water, do not put over an open flame. And I had this horrible vision of me trying to boil the water on an open flame with this glass pot, and it breaking and boiling water and a melting frog going all over the carpet. And just thought, it's probably not worth it. So we decided not to do that. But you guys all know what happens to a frog when you put it in warming water, right? It, it just sits there. It's not sensitive to the change in temperature. It will just sit there as the water gets hotter and hotter, even to the point of boiling, and the frog will die. Now, I was imagining you all looking in disbelief as I allowed this frog to boil to death during the sermon and feel terrible sympathy for this frog and the horrible thing that I'm doing to this frog, right? And here we are with people all around us, insensitive to the will of God insensitive to God's mercy, insensitive to the reality that those of us who are left in our sins are separated from God and are facing judgment, facing hell. And how much worse is that than seeing a frog die? This is what Paul's talking about in this this text, that um, the Gentiles 
are insensitive to God's will, insensitive to his grace. They, they don't respond to him. And therefore, they, they abandon themselves to licentiousness. They, they live in a way that doesn't honor him without regard to what, what his will is. There was a great theologian um, in the 1500s named Philip Melanchthon. He was kind of um, Martin Luther's right-hand man. They, they were professors together. And um, he was, um, I lost my quote. Um, he was famous as saying, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And so if I love material possessions, then my will chooses to go greedily after those things. I pursue them in my will. And I get them. I'll do whatever I want, whatever it takes, whether it's cheating, lying, stealing, being dishonest in work, whatever, whatever it takes, I'll pursue that. And then I'll justify it in my mind. Well, I always do that. They owe me. It didn't hurt anybody, or who cares if it hurt anyone? What the heart loves, the will chooses and the mind justifies. And it happens all the time in life. People go down this slippery slope. They get farther and farther into sin. The water gets hotter and hotter. They're in greater and greater danger. And they just keep going. You know, it starts out with being ungrateful. I should be grateful for what I have. I should be grateful for what God has done for me. Not grateful. It doesn't seem like that big a deal in gratitude. But then it leads to covetousness, right? Tenth commandment, you shall not covet. And as that covetous spirit intensifies in a person, then they start to cheat or lie or steal to get what they want. And then they got to cover up their cheating and their lying and their stealing. So they're going to get caught. And pretty soon you got Enron, right? Something horrible happens. People end up in prison. Or even worse, they're imprisoned by their sin. And they're under the power of death. When a person is insensitive to God's will, they, they abandon themselves to, to whatever urges they may have. They lack restraint. They lack self-control. And the same pattern of behavior um, manifests itself in a whole number of different ways. You know, um, I'm not at peace at, at heart. And that leads to anger issues. And that leads to verbal abuse. And that leads to physical abuse. Um, I, I have wandering eyes. And that leads to lust, which turns to surfing the web, which turns into addiction, which leads to seeking out other women and leads to uh, an affair. I start vaping or... I'm on painkillers, or I try pot, and that leads to getting hooked on meth or cocaine. It leads to all kinds of drug addictions. I've heard Marty say a couple times recently that a person doesn't just wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll be a drug addict. You know? You go one step to the next. One thing leads to the other. Water gets hotter and hotter. Death becomes more and more imminent. Now, we all sin. So this, this is not inevitable that people are going to follow this pattern. But the danger is real. And if, we don't, if we're not sensitive to the will of God and we don't repent from our sins, that's the path we're on. The person who's insensitive to the will of God is vulnerable to this progressive influence of sin. And if we never flee from our sin and we don't seek forgiveness through faith in Christ, we end up like the frog in the pot. It might be gradual, it might be imperceptible, but the ultimate result is death. Have you ever, ever been in, in, uh, soaking in a hot tub before? And you're just kind of getting sleepy and it feels really nice. And then you get out of the hot tub and you jump in the cold pool and it's like, sh totally shocks you. It alerts you, right? You ever done that before? It's invigorating. That's what Paul's trying to do in this text. When you get to verse 20, he's shouting at us. He says, that's not the way you learn Christ. Don't fall in this old pattern of behavior. Don't be lulled into sin. Don't fall into the trap of these dangers. That's not the way you learn Christ. Follow after the teachings of our Savior. He says, surely you have heard about him, and were taught him as truth is in Jesus. You know the truth of our Savior. Live for him. Live for his purposes. Follow in his ways. He says, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts. If we're not led by the Holy Spirit, if we're not following after the teachings of, of Jesus, we become deluded, we become misled, we become confused, and we end up trapped in our sins. Jesus declares the truth because he is the truth. And the way to live the life that we most deeply long for is simply to follow after him. Now, when we put our faith in Jesus, a transformation takes place in our lives. 
as, as we follow after Jesus, we begin to receive sensitivity training. We become sensitive to the will of God. We become sensitive to our need to repent. We become sensitive to our desire to learn his ways. And that's what Paul means when he says that we will be renewed in the spirit of our minds. He says to clothe yourselves with a new self, right? I've mentioned this before, but in ancient times, in Paul's time, he refers to this in Romans 6. He said, when a person was baptized in Paul's time, they would oftentimes go into a, a shallow river. And they would go in on one side wearing their old clothes. And they would take off their outer clothing, and then they would be baptized. And when they're baptized, they'd be completely submerged under the water. It was, it was like a watery grave, like they're being buried under the water. And then they're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're lifted up out of the water, and they're beginning this new life. And that's symbolized by going to the other side of the river, saying, I'm leaving that life behind. I'm beginning something new. And then they would put on a white robe, symbolizing the purity and the holiness and the peace they have through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's reminding them of. Leave the old life behind. Clothe yourselves with the new self. In Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. An old life is gone. A new life has begun. And be at peace. As we follow after Christ, we begin to reflect the likeness of God. He says, in righteousness and in holiness. We're made righteous because Jesus gives us his righteousness. We're then without sin, not because we, we still sin. But we're deemed to be without sin because Jesus has given us his righteousness. And we begin to resemble the likeness of God in holiness. Because we strive to live in a different way, different from the ways of the world. We strive to be loving and kind and gracious and generous and peaceful and self-controlled and, and all those kinds of things. And so our question today then, the question that we should ask ourselves from this text is, are you sensitive to God's will? As you're living your daily life, do you think to yourself, is this what God wants me to do? Is this how God wants me to live? Is this decision the one that God wants me to make? Or, if we've done something wrong, and we all do, do we then say, oh, God did not want me to do this. I shouldn't have done that. I need to repent from this. I need to start over. I need to try again. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become increasingly sensitive to God's will. And on the other hand, those who are insensitive to God's will are like the frog in the pot. They don't realize the danger that they're in. And as the water gets hotter and hotter, it soon comes to a boil. Now, last night, we, um, DJ took the youth to the judgment house over at First PH. A bunch of us went. And it was well done. You know, and they, they obviously, um, they, they create a narrative, they create a story that compels us to make this choice. Do we want to go to heaven? Do we want to go to hell? And the scene of hell is really scary, trust me. They got this horrible-looking guy. looks like Satan. And they got the, uh, the, the sound system ramped up, so he has this really deep and, and horrible-sounding voice. And the lights are all red, and it's really terrifying. Well, one of the guys in our group, he's an adult, but he's with our group, hanging out with, with us last night. And the this, this show gets a little bit long, and you get kind of crammed together in these rooms. You've got to stand real tightly with each other watching the show. And he got uncomfortable at one point. He needed to go sit down. And so he just left one of the early scenes in the show and just walked down the hall looking for a chair. And he... He turned in the wrong room, and he ended up in hell. <laughs> he got a sneak preview, and the devil was scaring a whole bunch of other people that were ahead of us. And it had such a powerful impact on him. The, the, the God's judgment was so real to him in that moment, it shocked him. It awakened him from the spiritual lethargy, and he rededicated his life to Christ. And so this text poses us with this question. Are you sensitive to God's will? Do you recognize your call to repentance and faith? Or are you insensitive? Just keep on living the life that you've been living like the frog in the pot. So now I have these 24 frogs. What am I going to do with 24 plastic frogs? Well, I came up with a solution. Um, well, I used to work at Children's Home Society, this home for abused kids. I would get these bracelets at the Christian bookstore that said frog on them. You guys might be familiar with that. The acronym frog stands for fully Rely on God. And so instead of being like a frog in the pot who's insensitive to God's will, I'm challenging us as a congregation to learn to fully rely upon God. And as, the, as we go out of the, the church today, I want to hand these out to the kids. And they're not just a little toy. They're a reminder, right, 
to fully rely on God. Fully rely on God to forgive us of our sins. Fully rely on God so we might make the right choices. Fully rely on God for the strength we need to live the life that he'd have us to live. And then we can live as Paul challenges us in this text. We might no longer live as the Gentiles live. We live as people who have been made new in Christ, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. May it be so. Amen. Our offering text today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, 